let's get started. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Professor Pierre Dupont. Uh, he's going to talk to us about medical robotics just by way of pedigree, so you know where he's coming from. He got all of his degrees at uh, RPI, uh, his undergraduate, master's and PhD at RPI. And shortly after that, he did a postdoc at Harvard University, and then he became a professor at Boston University uh, until 2009, and then he moved to uh, a Children's Hospital at Harvard, where he currently is, has a very active and large program in medical robotics. Uh, this work, of course, is, is highly recognized. He's won Best Paper Awards, most recently in 2012, the IPRA uh, Best Paper Award uh, in Medical Robotics. But his real contribution, the, the biggest thing you should know is, is it's because of him I'm here today. You see, uh, many years ago, when I was interviewing for faculty jobs, I had two interviews. One at Boston University, where Pierre was a professor, and the one immediately after at Carnegie Mellon. Okay, where I currently work. And, and uh, the Boston University interview was a Thursday, Friday, and then the uh, Carnegie Mellon was a Monday, Tuesday. So I had the weekend off uh, uh, in between interviews. So you understand the flight pattern of Boston, Pittsburgh. And I really was screwing up my Boston University interview. I, mean, I was just doing a bad job. And in the middle of it, Pierre just pulled me aside and said, this is what you should be saying. Okay. He dictated all the answers to all the standard questions, and, and I memorized them as best as I could in my head, but I really didn't have quite enough time to get it just right. But I went home that weekend, because I took the weekend off with you, and I wrote down all the questions, and I had it all memorized, so when I came to Carnegie Mellon, I, I, I was really... <laughs> Embarrassing with Pierre in the room, uh, but he left Boston University, so I said, yes. <laughs> so, with that, I, uh, I'm looking forward to Pierre's talk, and let's give him the same uh, interrogative question and answer that we uh, like to give our speakers. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Howie, and, and thanks all for attending. I, I don't often have a, a standing room only crowd, so I, I'm very appreciative of that. As Howie mentioned, I, I was at Boston University in the College of Engineering for quite a few years. Um, but I was, I was doing more and more collaboration with clinicians at the local hospitals, in particular children's hospitals. So I, I had the opportunity to move my lab there. Um, and it was one of a, a sort of a good news, bad news scenario. The, the good news was that I was the only engineering lab at the hospital. And the bad news was I was the only engineering lab at the hospital. So you know it was, it was kind of scary because all the other labs were wet labs. I remember meeting with one of the associate deans of Harvard Medical School, and, and, and she said, we've heard of this I-E-E-E -E -E before. Um, <laughs> so so it, it's, been, it's been kind of a dramatic transition, but the, you know, the great part about it is I'm, I'm surrounded by clinicians who are not afraid to tell me, you know, Pierre, that's a stupid idea. Um, try something else. So what I want to do today is, is talk a little bit about a couple projects we've had going on for, for a little bit of time now. Um, and of course, you know, I'm talking, I'm ta speaking to the choir here. Um, so you guys are all familiar with existing, you know, medical robotic systems, the, the Da Vinci by Intuitive. And, you know, the one thing that about it is it's huge. You know, it's a fantastically large robot and it's, it's designed very well engineered to replicate how people do um, laparoscopic surgery. And so as I've gotten into it more and more, you know, what I recognize is that trying to have a robot reproduce how a surgeon does surgery is not necessarily a good idea. And, and my gut feeling going forward is, is to, that we really have to re-engineer, uh, uh, reinvent how surgery is done. Um, in order to, to make more progress. So what I wanted to talk about today was just a couple of projects that I've been doing and, and really trying to get away from this huge size of robots where you have straight instruments um, to a smaller continuum uh, uh, scale robot where you have something millimeters in diameter that can snake its way into the body, not it requires such invasive access. Um, but then ultimately, can we think of tetherless robots you know, along this, uh, the same lines as endoscopic pills, but with much more sophistication. So I'm going to just give you an, a broad overview um, of these two different project areas today. Um, and I'll start out with the continuum robots. 
And, and the best way to do it is to think about it in the context of a clinical problem. So I'm, I'm actually in uh, the Department of Cardiovascular Surgery. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of uh, um, unique to be called a you know, professor of surgery. Um, I, I don't ask me to operate, but I can get you a good rate on an OR. Um, but but in, in, you know, in cardiac interventions these days, you have this alternative between open heart surgery, which the surgeons do, and catheter-based interventions, which the cardiologists do. And there's really been a shift over the last 20 years from left to right because you know, cardiac surgery is very invasive, lots of chest trauma, um, lots of, uh, well, cardiopulmonary bypass, which creates neurocognitive de deficits. Um, but you have this amazing dexterity of the two hands and your, your vision system to perform the surgery, um, where alternatively, um, with catheter-based interventions, you're, from a mechanical engineering point of view, you're operating on the opposite end of this extremely flexible transmission. So your control is much uh, more limited, um, but they come up with sophisticated devices which require very little positional control to do some repair. But because of the greatly induced, reduced risks compared to surgery, you know, it's really taken off, and that's where we want to be in the future. With you know, doing everything on a beating heart, avoiding all of this trauma. Um, but if you say, well, what do you need? We actually need, you know, two different parts. We need um, a delivery platform, and that's the robot, something that will get our tools to the site. And then we actually need a toolbox, too. And, and you know, as, uh, as engineers or as a robotics people, you know, I, I don't know if this is just my own bias, but I always think about the robot, and I never think about the tools at the end. And, and I remember some years ago now hearing one of these celebrity chefs um, describe pasta as a sauce delivery vehicle. Um, and you know, it struck me that's all the robot is. You know, we, the robot is just to get the tool there to do the job. And so in looking at this intercardiac surgery stuff, I've, in some sense I've had to spend more time on the tools than on, on the robots themselves. But I'll, I'll spend some time talking about both. And so for the delivery platform, um, we, we started out, you know, when I started working with the surgeons, they were actually taking laparoscopic type instruments and sticking them through the heart wall of the beating heart to do procedures like, oh, can't we come up with something that's a little curvy, uh, much more reduced in diameter and has some stirability to it? So we happen to be doing this other project um, in fetal cardiac interventions and this is something we do at Boston Children's um, are pretty successful with for these kids who have what's called hypoplastic left heart syndrome. So um, it, it's a developmental problem where the aortic valve becomes blocked and so the left ventricle which is pumping out through the aortic valve um, struggles and its, its growth depends on seeing the right pressure variation with time and because it can't pump out the valve it's tr it first tries to, to compensate and then it gives up. The kid's born with an undersized uh, left ventricle and, and it you know, creates a lifelong of issues. Um, so what, the, what the, uh, the cardiologists were doing was sticking a needle through the mom's abdomen into the uterus, through the fetal chest wall, into the left ventricle of the baby and inflating a balloon in the aortic valve to open it up. And, and it turned out that the biggest problem in this procedure was simply that as they stuck the needle in, the baby floating in the amniotic fluid would spin around. So he said, well, can we come up with something that's basically is going to go in like a needle, pop out, envelop an arm and a leg, and hold the baby still? So that, we were doing the, this device at the top. And as we started making these things, we looked at how these, the, the point was that the, the proximal portion is much stiffer, so as you pull it in, it, the, the helical coil straightens. But we looked at the interaction of these tubes, and this graduate student and I looked at each other and said, hey, we could make a robot out of this. So, so that's what uh, we set off to do. Actually, Matt Heverly, my student, his real love was space robotics. So now he's at uh, JPL, and he's the lead driver on his latest Mar Mars rovers. So he left me to get all the work done. Um, but what, we, you know, what we, we had stumbled upon was this idea of concentric tube robots. So we take nighttime tubes, super elastic, we pre-curve them, insert them one inside each other, and then if we create a drive system, as shown on the left, that rotates and translates the, the tubes at their base, 
then we can create this coordinated motion. And it, you know, it always uh, confuses non-robotics people. They're like, well, what is the robot here? Well, you know, I just call it the drive system. But this is the robot. This is the part that would go inside uh, the body. Um, and the, uh, you know, what's interesting is um, how the heck now do you design or take sets of pre-curved tubes and do something interesting with it. And you know, we thought, of course, that we were the very first to have looked at this uh, topic. And then as we started doing the literature search for, the, uh, you know, for a patent application, we realized, oh, shoot, you know, other people have looked at pairs of tubes that are either where one is, is dominates the stiffness of the other or the tubes are of comparable stiffness. But nobody looked at, at more than two tubes. And, and how to choose those interactions. So that's how we were able to find a, a new spot you know, to make our patent filing. Um, but it becomes a very interesting uh, design problem um, of how do you pick the shapes and the relative stiffnesses of the tubes. Um, and so being from a robotics background, what we wanted to do was to try to decouple the motion of each telescoping section. And so you know, it turned out that each section, at least in our paradigm, it should be made of a single tube that's dominated by the stiffness of the preceding tubes, or the section can be made of a pair of tubes. And if it's made of a pair of curved tubes and you rotate them, then you get this, this variable curvature section. You put those all together, um, and you get, you, know, you get a robot design. But in distinction with just about any other robot out there, um, the design of the robot depends on the workspace you need. So if you have some particular clinical application in mind, you've got to design, come up with a set of tubes for that procedure. So it's a procedure specific design. Since, you know, the point is once you've designed a set of tubes for a procedure, you're all set. You never need to do that again. But since we were the ones that came up with the idea, we had to work on it. So this is a procedure that, that we've worked on for um, going in and for people who have uh, holes between the right and left atrium here, um, and the hole goes through this area connecting here to here, um, we wanted to be able to patch those shut. So this is a robot design that's intended to enter the internal jugular vein in the neck, go down to the right atrium, and have the, the ability to, go, to move throughout the right atrium. So we came up with some design algorithms where you take 3D anatomical images that provide your anatomical constraints, as well as part of that image defining your surgical target set. And then you, you run through some numerical optimization schemes to end up with a tube set that ultimately we would hope would be prepackaged and disposable or recyclable um, to do that. And what's interesting, you know, when you look at a procedure just about anywhere in the body, um, you can decompose the whole length of the robot into two parts. There's a proximal part that's just responsible for entering the body and then navigating to the surgical site. And pretty much when you get in that, that in there, you hold it constant in shape. And then there's a distal portion that's actually responsible for the surgery. And so by noticing that decomposition, you can simplify uh, you know, the design process. So, so for example, you know, this is a design that we did for this plugging of a hole between the right and left atrium. We came out with a certain number of tubes for navigating from the neck down into the heart, and then certain tubes inside the heart that we use for uh, actually deploying our devices. Um, but of course, you know, this extends to other parts of the body. Um, I, I was fortunate to have a neurosurgical fellow, Patrick Codd, sitting in my lab. And, and these guys who are in their surgical training will often take a year or two for research. And the price they pay is that they're on call to do the surgeries during the night while they're doing research during the day. So this was actually a case that Patrick uh, did at MGH where a child came in who had this. This is an MRI. The dark is the brain tissue. The white is the uh, fluid-filled ventricle. So normally, the, the ventricles in your brain are much smaller than this. But he had a choroid plexus tumor shown here that was overproducing uh, this fluid, cerebrospinal fluid, and basically compressing his brain. So what he had to do to remove that surgically was to take a bunch of skull off, cut through the good brain tissue um, uh, right here to reach the ventricle so that he could lop out the tumor. Um, so you know, that surgical corridor remains after surgery. So this is post-operative. Remember, there was good brain tissue running through here. 
Not anymore because he needed the surgical access. So again, here was a design that he came up with where you could enter through a, you know, a one or two diameter, a millimeter diameter hole to reach the entire target set you need to, to suck that thing out. So you know, wherever you are in the body, there is an approach um, for designing these. So, so that's design. Um, but then what was really perhaps the biggest challenge is kinematics. You know, we, we think of kinematics as being trivial if you're thinking about revolute and prismatic joints and algebraic equations. But here, because you're dealing with the interaction of flexible curved tubes, it's really it's a 3D beam bending problem. So, you know, it was, it was a lot of fun for me and my students to, you know, learn some new math and figure out how to solve this, you know, in, in a, in basically even a quasi-static uh, situation. You know, it, it, especially in surgery, you're not moving fast, there's a lot of damping from surrounding tissue, so dynamics aren't important per se. Um, but if you want to apply forces, you know, you would traditionally think, oh, we just use a Jacobian transpose. Well, not if the robot's flexible. So, so there's a whole lot of fun math, which I figured late on a Friday afternoon I would omit, um, but which is out there for you um, if you're interested. Um, but once you got those models in place, then you can think about, well, what's the best way to control it? And what's interesting is, you know, because the continuum robots are compliant, flexible, you can just often get away with, with just position control and use the passive compliance of the robot. So we do these, these beating heart surgeries in pigs, and you know, we get away with the fact that we can press against the tissue and we're not that stiff, so we'll flex if the load is too high, but we can also displace the tissue some. So we'll, we, we've uh, survived well on that, but we use, we've also looked at stiffness control so that you could actively dial in the stiffness by modifying the shape of the robot. Um, so, and that's something you guys are, are probably uh, familiar with, and depending on what you're doing, you know, you can, uh, you can implement whatever control you want. Um, but let's, you know, let's flip over to the, uh, the tools now and, and do that in the context of looking at this bimanual dissection of a chicken leg, okay? And so here, the right arm has some one millimeter wide diameter forceps and the left arm has a laser in it. And we're doing, you know, surgical dissection the way it's always done, but with robots. And, and the key part here is look at all of the workspace around the site that's needed by the robots to, to simply move around, okay? So if you want to do minimally invasive surgery, you know, except for lapro laparoscopy where you can blow up the abdomen to create that huge workspace, you don't have all of that space. And so, you know, this is sort of an example of very simple tools, um, complex motions to do the task. And on the other end of the continuum, you have simple motions, complex tools. And somehow we want to slide back and forth, you know, and find the right balance. And, and that's really what you see in these alternatives of the tools that are used in cardiac surgery versus the tools that are used by cardiologists at the end of a catheter. You know, the surgical tools, you, you have the dexterity of your hand to manipulate them. Um, you have great imaging from your eyes to see them. Alternatively, you're using fluoroscopy or ultrasound um, with a lousy uh, delivery system, very flexible delivery system. And so you have a little more sophistication, but also notice these are pretty simple things. They just, they're sort of self-aligning, spring-loaded devices. So if we want to, you know, take things that are currently done as open surgery and find a way to do them with a catheter or, or a, you know, a robotic type of catheter, then we really need to look at a new tool set. So we can't use those, and so what do we do? So we were fortunate enough to partner with this startup in California, Microfabrica, that had this metal surface micromachining technique. So they would lay things down in layers of 20, uh, 25 microns thick, uh, nickel cobalt material, um, and it was, you know, an electrochemical uh, type of uh, process that you can see right here, so that you can, you know, after release, you get these fully functioning micro machines that have millimeter scale dimensions, but micron scale tolerances. And when I started working with them, you know, the whole management team was really research oriented. Of course, they were trying to find where they could make money, so they were very open to stuff. And and you know, they were able to work together to come up with these really complex uh, designs. And I'll show you 
um, a couple of different uh, sets. You know, if you think about any surgical procedure, there's basically two things that make it up. There's uh, removing tissue, and there's attaching pieces of tissue together. So, you know, we went to NIH and we said, look, that's we're going to come up with two sets of tools for a toolkit. Tissue removal devices, tissue approximation devices, and we got a real cool technology uh, for doing it. So let me show you what we came up with. And I'll start out with the uh, tissue removal devices. Um, and there are lots of cases where uh, you want to remove uh, tissue inside the heart. You know, I'm at a pediatric hospital, and so, for example, there are some kids who were just born with excess muscle tissue down in either one of the ventricles. This is a bump here. And it occludes the flow through the valves. And so right now they have to do open surgery and just cut these lumps of extra muscle out. And what's kind of cool to me is, you know, you think if you cut something out on your skin, you have to sew it up. Inside the heart, they don't have to do that. They just have to cut it out and leave it, and, and a little scar tissue will form. It'll be fine. Um, but they have to get it out of there through open surgery. So could we come up with a tool that would do this inside the beating heart? And so here's, uh, we came up with a couple different types of technology. This one, as I'll show you in a subsequent slide, when you're working at the millimeter scale, removing tissue simply gets hard because the tool has to grab the tissue, you know, chew it up and suck it in. We're inside the heart. We can't let anything escape. Um, and so this was meant to be a pretty aggressive tool. It's got these counter-rotating sets of wheels um, that grab it, you know, pull it in, chew it up, and it gets sucked out, as I'll show you through the base of the robot. This design, it's a little bit more like a rotary razor. There's a stator on the front and then a rotor inside. And, and this, you know, really we were thinking about this in the context of can we machine tissue? Um, and, and so this is a more aggressive design. This is great for taking off surface layers, although you can cut more deeply. Um, but it's, it's just, you know, it was amazing how much time it took to get one of these things to work. You think a heart. You know, it can't be hard to cut through a heart, but, but actually the inner and outer layers, you know, are kind of like chicken skin. Very elastic, tough to tear, great for jamming up small dimensional openings. And so we went through a couple of years where, you know, we would blow out gear trains and what have you because we just weren't making it strong enough. So it took a while to get this right. Um, we also, you know, recognized a couple things where, um, we can't let the tissue escape, so we've got to suck it in. But when you deal with blood, blood is always trying to coagulate on you. So we, we had to provide, we not only needed to provide a fluid as a transport medium for the, for the tissue we chewed up, we had to make it heparinized saline so the heparin would counteract the, the desire to, to uh, embolize. So, so we got that all going. And, and what's cool, I'll show, that, I'll show that on the next slide. So, so here's a specific example, um, incredible engineering challenge where you're aspirating through the center of the robot, the, the tool is mounted at the end, you're providing irrigation between the robot and this rotating drive system, um, and you've got to get that all balanced, um, tolerances are very tight, um, and, and what's, what's cool, you know, here's a two millimeter design, it's scalable, what's cool is if you compare it to the existing micro debriders, which are, they're a rotating tube within a tube design there. And they depend on, if you can see that design there, they depend on tissue herniating into that window, and then you can lop it off. You know, well, that's great for a polyp that's sticking out. But when you're trying to, to machine tissue layers, you know, it's not going to grab anything at all. Whereas this gives you true cutting right at the end, and you can see how we're, you know, we're cutting a groove into there. Here I think I've got a, a video of an ex vivo trial. You know, we've cut a pig heart open, um, coming down from the atrium into the ventricle and cutting out where there would be an obstruction there. You can see it milling a little cavity. We've also, you know, a month or so ago, we actually did in vivo trials, cutting holes inside a beating heart. Um, those are a little more gruesome, so I, I didn't bother to put them in. Um, the slides, but you know the, the thing is it's pretty cool that we got this thing working um, inside a heart. So that's tissue removal. I remember I said that the other part of it all was tissue approximation. So in this case, you know what what we were looking at is can we um, can we close this hole 
between the right and left atria of the heart. You can see how the blood flow leaks through here. This is a hole that we all have you know, before we're born um, and is supposed to close up a few months after we're born. Um, most people it does. Some people doesn't, and there's, there's a bit of a controversy, but um, it may be that this hole causes strokes. And, and so there's, there's been a, there were a lot of startups that came and went based on um, some FDA trials related to this. But, but all of the approaches that people were pushing were, I don't know if you can see this clearly, but it, you can see a fabric on sort of an umbrella frame here. So it's actually an umbrella on the back. So it's a double umbrella that folds up inside a catheter. And the idea is you're supposed to stick it through the pre-existing hole, pop it open, and it covers the hole, okay? So, it, you know, this, this company won under, and one of the main reasons was uh, um, if you're trying to prevent strokes, you're trying to prevent, the way you do that is preventing um, emboli from going from the right to the left side and shooting to the brain. Now, if you stick a big piece of metal and fabric in the left side of the heart, that tends to generate emboli that will shoot to your brain and give you a stroke. Um, so, you know, one of those chicken and egg things. Um, but um, so, so you, you're ideally, you want to put as little foreign material as you can in the left side of the heart. And so this was the device that we came up with. And, and you know, I, I hate to admit it's this simple, but it's basically a double toggle bolt with a ratchet in the middle, OK? So that the wings, these pairs of wings fold up so it can fit. You'll see that in more detail. Submillimeter resolution here. But this is the part that gets exposed in the left side of the heart. It's only, you know, these, these wings are only like a millimeter wide. They'll get covered over with, uh, with endocardium and won't even be exposed to the blood within a couple of months. Um, secondly, you know, these are sort of a spring open, one size fits all. And the surgeon we were working with says, no, 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 I want to be able to adjust that. So the ratchet allows that very adju uh, precise adjustment based on the patient's needs. Um, and finally, we need to stick this through a 3D curvy robot, so we had to design in the flexibility so it wouldn't snap as we went. Um, so let me just show you how this, uh, this device gets deployed. This isn't from a robot, it's just from a needle, but very cool. So it's got eight moving parts. They're, it's fabricated fully assembled, so it's like sort of a wafer fabrication process where you make 100 of them at a time on the same wafer. Um, and, and with, you know, with these sub-millimeter uh, resolution. You know, so we, we did all this functionality, um, pulled this off, and then the surgeon says, no, 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 I want to be able to take it out in case something goes wrong. So we had to go back and design another feature so that if he didn't like how it was positioned, we could release those distal wings and pull it out. That's when things got, you know, really complicated. But, um, so let me show you um, this. We met, we've done this on, uh, you know, in pigs. The great thing about being at a hospital, too, I, I roll the robot on the elevator, we go down to the basement, and there's the animal operating rooms. So just fantastic in that regard. Um, so robot drive system, actually it turned out to be a fairly simple robot shape to go from the neck down into the right atrium. Um, what's cool is we're not just deploying a device here, we actually have to manipulate tissue. So we use the robot to, to poke through this top layer. This hole is like a tunnel. It's one layer lying over another layer. We grab through this, it's very thin here, so we grab this, we have to pull it down, poke through the other layer, and then deploy the device uh, to close it. So this is what uh, the surgery looks like. Um, we use, you know, and this actually gets into my, uh, you know, some of the current work I'm doing in terms of imaging. Imaging inside the beating heart is hard. You have ultrasound, you have fluoroscopy. The ultrasound shows you everything, although there are a lot of imaging artifacts on the robot, in a human being, we could stick an, uh, an ultrasound probe down the esophagus. In the pig, the lung is in the way. So we open the chest and put the probe right on the heart so we can see what we're doing that way. The problem is that the ultrasound has a resolution of one to two millimeters. The device we're deploying has a dimension of one to two millimeters. We can't see it. So we have to switch to fluoroscopy to see the device, but then we can't see the tissue. So, you know, now they have uh, register, you know, systems so that you can co-register your intraoperative fluoro and ultrasound to do it a little better, but, you know, still it's, it's challenging. Um, 
So, so just to show you what this looks like. So there, oh, you know, I, I didn't replace this image. It's a funny story here. My postdoc grabbed this image. Um, it's from like either nature or science. It's anatomically incorrect. The, <laughs> these layers are supposed to be reversed. Um, but I, I forgot to, to switch that. Um, but the thing is, when you're, doing, when you're doing these animal surgeries, you can't order pigs that have a specific defect, <laughs> right? We were lucky, the first pig we ordered happened to have the defect, and that's this one. And so this, on do color Doppler, you can see this jet, which is this leak from the right to the left, exacerbated so we could see it well. Um, but, but for all our other procedures, we had to go in and create the hole and then go and seal it. And, and you know, it took us, the first time we did one of these surgeries, I think 30 things went wrong. I thought, oh god, this is never going to work. You know, the next time it was 20 things, and it was 10 things. By the time we finished, all of the problem was creating the hole, you know, without screwing up. You know, that was, that turned out to be the hard part. Um, so, so we used, um, we used ultrasound for navigation. So here in the pig is that channel we're trying to close. And we needed to position the robot up here. Um, and here's like on a good day what the, uh, the anatomy looks like in ultrasound. You can see the robot coming down. Here's the ridge. There's the channel going in. You know, so the, the surgeon I work with was, was like, he, he's, oh yeah, there it is. You know, it's there? Yeah, there it is. So he was really good at this, but it took a heck of a lot of practice. But then, as I say, once we started deploying it, you know, you couldn't see it. So we'd switch over to Fluoro. Here's the device. You can see it inside the robot. It's coming out. You notice it bends when it comes out. We were pushing against the wall of the left atrium, but we couldn't see the wall. So when it came out, it bent. It still worked. But again, it was one of those things where, you know, imaging is just tough. And here's the... Uh, if this flips for me. Here's the, um, you know, the results. So you know, we had the leak before, no leak after. Um, and if you compare, that's, that's the right atrium side. But remember, on the left atrium side is where you want very little foreign material. This is if you're using this occlusion device. You, know, you get this huge amount of material compared to this small amount of material. He's sticking the forceps into the channel that's been sealed with this device. And you can see how little, little is showing. So, you know, it, it was, uh, we got it all to work and it worked well. Um, when we, we actually had written the grant proposal and all, like I said, this was a potentially really hot market. You know, and I think George and I were talking earlier about trying to find that killer wrap for your technology, you know. And, and so there were like, dozen, uh, at least a dozen startups looking at PFO closure because all these clinical trials were looking to show this. And then they all failed um, and all the companies went down and we had the perfect solution for a non-problem. Yeah? We try to avoid to use the word killer app with that whole <laughs> Yeah, yeah, well, um, in this case it was, but anyway. <laughs> um, so, so the point is that uh, you know, we, we came up with a great delivery system. We came up with a device that, that met our specifications. But, you know, things in cardiology are such a moving target um, that, you know, it's, it's really challenging to find that, that perfect um, livable app. I don't know. Um, Life-saving life app, yeah. So, so anyway, just looking forward, you know, the themes I wanted to touch on was this idea of, don't try to have a robot, you know, do surgery the way a doctor would. It's just, you know, the capabilities, the strong suits of a robot are different. Um, and so a lot of that comes down to trading off the complexity of the motions and the complexity of the tools. So that's one thing. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, in image-guided surgery, um, because a lot of times you have no touch sensing, you're using the imaging to infer contact, to infer the forces you're applying. And if you're doing that in an endoscopic situation, um, surgeons get very good at knowing just how hard they're the good surgeons do, just how hard they're pulling so they don't damage tissue. Um, but you know, when you have, in, in a situation inside the heart where the imaging quality is so bad, it's not endoscopic, um, you know, we, we want to know if we're touching, 
the end of the robot produces this huge artifact in ultrasound. So we would have to deform the tissue considerably to say, oh yeah, the tissue is deforming. We're in contact. So it's, that's an area that I'm, I'm working a lot on now, both in terms of integrating imaging into the tip of the robot as well as integrating touch sensing, uh, soft sensing. And you know, I'm working with Rob Wood at Harvard on this and, and uh, doing some things ourselves. Um, so, okay, I was just flipping on the other one. So let me, uh, let me move on. Okay, move on to the next part here. So, you know, you, I, I hopefully I've conveyed the idea of how if you use this notion of a continuum robot, that's a 3D curve, small in diameter. You can really do a lot less trauma. Um, but then, then the question is, how far can we push this? And is there a way to get rid of this mechanical tether to the outside world or electrical tether? Um, and so, of course, you know, Metin has been doing a lot of fantastic uh, things uh, with regard to both you know, capsules and micro, uh, micro robots. Um, and so I was trying to find my own twist on it. And we said, well, you know, we need to uh, actuate, but we also want excellent imaging. We're, we're very aware of excellent imaging. And uh, MRI is something that could provide that. You know, it's, it's, um, it's a resource. You know, if you go and uh, visit Brad Nelson at ETH, and he's creating this magnet coil system way down in his sub-basement um, uh, to do these cardiology things, you know, and it's this huge, very expensive system. And it's fantastic, don't get me wrong. But if, you, if there's a way to leverage an existing huge expensive system to do this, uh, maybe that will be more acceptable. So MRIs are huge expensive, but accepted and widely available systems. And, and the interesting thing um, about them is that you know, the technology that you can develop for actuation and control you know, applies over many length scales. So you can make sort of interventional devices, maybe you want to take a biopsy, you have something that sticks on the patient, you put them both in the scanner, and it's actuated by the scanner and takes a sample. You know, alternately, you, we've been playing with this intermediate scale area where you put something, you know, it's not necessarily a mobile robot, but it sits inside the body for some number of months and adjusts flow in a valve or applies forces to a tissue. Um, I'll show you an example that we're working on there. You know, and then finally, at the smallest scale, you know, can you make things either millimeter or submillimeter that are, are swimming through the body? Um, and we've been looking at regions of you know, low or slow flow, and so we've been looking at the spinal canal and the ventricles of the brain for that. Um, and I'll mention a little bit about that. But what's, what's interesting is that um, you know, there are a fair number of folks, or a small number of folks, I guess, who are doing these tabletop coil systems for magnetic actuation. And, there are some real distance differences with MRI because of this fixed, strong central field. Um, but nevertheless, you know, we were able to make a motor uh, out of it, and this got us to be a, a finalist for a paper award, but I think we probably lost to Howie um, when it all came down to the, to the end. But the idea being, um, you know, it's, it's much like a, a brushless DC motor. We simply create a rotor, and, the, and what we can do is use uh, magnetic gradients to pull things around. So we stick a ball bearing um, in a cavity. Um, the, the ball bearing becomes magnetized as soon as it's in the scanner and wants to remain aligned with the central field, which is constant in direction. Um, so we enclose it in a cavity, and then we just apply rotating gradients. Um, since the ball's in a cavity, it can stay aligned with the field and still rotate around. So a very, very simple concept. You know, the tough part is that MRI scanners were not designed to do this. And, and so, you know, we spend a heck of a lot of time trying to program the simplest closed loop control scenarios. And, you know, someone will review our paper and say, well, look, you're just doing PD control. He's like, do you know how much time I went into getting PD control? <laughs> you know, it's, it's just incredible. You know, and what are the reasons? Well, first of all, MRI imaging is extremely slow. And nobody's thinking about closing the loop. You know, they're, they're, their idea of closing the loop is, we'll adjust the scan plane. You know, oh, we took an image here, let's adjust it to that. So it's, it's a heck of a lot of programming. And then it, just as soon as I get all my code working, they, they say, good news, we're upgrading our scanner. All new software, of course. You know, we gotta start over writing everything. 
So it's, it's, uh, it's a challenge, but we've been very lucky to make you know, some progress quickly. So this was our first little gizmo. You know, I, said, I told my, my postdoc, go make me a needle driving actuator. The next thing I know, he's mugged some kid taking their Legos, and he's <laughs> building this on the bench top. Um, and, but you know, what's interesting is that um, with, uh, and the beautiful thing about this is you can just play through loads of designs, but here's our little rotor. He's got a ball bearing in here. Of course, we had to go through a lot to convince the MRI safety people that the ball bearing wasn't going to shoot around the scanner and ruin it. Um, we, uh, this particular design can, was designed to produce a half a Newton force. Now, we looked through the literature. The highest biopsy forces for human prostate are up to 20 Newtons. You know, we've come up with a design scenario that's pretty much realistic where you could get forces that high and of course not using Legos, which turn out to have like really low efficiency. <laughs> um, so, you know, this was a, like half a Newton force, which was good enough for cardiac uh, um, biopsy, which is what we were targeting. But, you know, it's also possible to go much, much larger. Here's an example of uh, the, uh, the MRI scanner, you know, with a pig heart in an actual uh, bore, um, working away. Um, you know, we submitted a paper on this. I don't think they believed we had it working, so we had to send the video with the paper to convince them, yes, it truly is working. They also said, well, we don't think, you know, Legos are good enough to go in a journal. <laughs> they're, they're, they're good enough for a conference paper, but not a journal, you know. And I'm like, oh. So, um, but, but let's talk about, you know, control now. Um, so here's a, uh, a block diagram. And, and what we did, we started out, you know, if you think of electric motor, you know, it's doing commutation, a lot of times mechanically, but it's applying, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's applying the magnetic field in the stator that's appropriately aligned to produce the most torque in the rotor to generate motion, okay? Um, we've got to do that with the scanner um, and through programming. And so, we said, well, the first pass, we're going to do it with open loop commutation. So the idea here is we just apply a rotating gradient field, you know, and we hope that the rotor keeps up with it. And there is, you know, it's subject to slipping and what have you. But it turned out that when you're doing things like needle insertion, where you're applying a load to an elastic, you know, material, that actually helps to stabilize the rotor rotation. So as I'll show you in a minute, we were able to do you know, uh, if we say had a needle at a particular location and we wanted to move 10, advanced 10 millimeters, you know, we could do it, we could do it. Um, and then we also looked at closed loop commutation where, you know, for the open loop, we were tracking the needle. Whereas in closed loop, it's harder because you have to track the rotor, but then you can do position control of the rotor, you can do, you know, no, no slipping, and you can get maximum torque output. So we looked at both. This is definitely the harder one. Um, but let me just, you know, what gets tough are things like estimating the position of either the needle or the rotor. So, you know, the easy way to do it is to say, well, look, I'll just take an MRI image and I'll find the needle in the image and then I'll know where the needle is and I'll know if I need to move further. That's a, it's a slow imaging process and then it takes a lot of imaging pro image processing to extract the needle. But instead, if you stick a, uh, a little fiducial marker, this is a vitamin E capsule, on the needle outside the tissue, you know, it's really easy to track that and you can design a pulse sequence that's very fast. Um, the, the problem is that you have to uh, make sure that the tissue doesn't screw up your signal. But um, I had a couple uh, of guys working on this, uh, Paniotis Bartholomeos and Christos Bergelis, who, who just did a, a fantastic uh, job um, putting this together. So, Christos in particular programmed this, it takes seven and a half milliseconds to pick out where that fiducial marker is. Um, and wi without, um, without either getting obscured by the tissue and also without um, having the, the rotor obscure the position of the fiducial marker. You know, the first time my guy presented a talk on this, this was Paniotis, the first question in the audience, you know, we're the talk is, an actuator, an MRI powered actuator. The first question is, is that MRI compatible? It's like, you know, um, we didn't even think of that because of course it had to be <laughs> MRI compatible. But, you know, what are the issues of MRI compatibility? Well, one is safety. You never put uh, ferrous material 
like our ball bearing in the scanner. Um, number two is imaging artifacts. You put metal in a scanner and it screws up the image in the surrounding area. You know, so those were, were both uh, issues that we had to you know, worry about and compensate for to make sure that imaging the tissue or imaging our fiducial markers, we don't get screwed up and of course that we don't have uh, any unsafe forces being produced. Um, so, so the other thing I should bring in here is that a tough part about using the MRI to both image, to, to do closed loop control where you're both imaging and actuating is that you can't, at least to date, we haven't done both at the same time. So we're imaging, then we're actuating. Then we're imaging, then we're actuating. And we're trying to use an imaging sequence that doesn't actuate. You know, so, so that's why you know, we used a, a balanced uh, gradient sequence here. And, and you can see the GX and the GY. You can see that the positive and negative areas are about the same. So it's one of these uh, propulsive neutral imaging sequences. And also the gradients that you need are much smaller than for imaging than for actuation. So it, it works out. Um, so, but here's how, you know, here's this, this uh, interleaved actuation and imaging. And basically, you know, we set it up so that we could detect a little over a millimeter displacement and each actuation cycle was 250 microns. So we do five actuation cycles and then we do an imaging cycle, you know, because we do as, as the minimum number to be detectable. Um, and so let me just show you an example here. So this was driving a needle in. This is the before image. You can see the needle tip. You know, even though we have our actuator here, it's not obscuring the image of the tissue at all, compatible. Um, we want to advance the tip uh, 10 millimeters. Um, so we, you know, we turn the thing on. Um, it monitors how far it has to go. Bang, it stops. And I think the error was like 0.6 millimeters because it's got a resolution of a little over one millimeter. So you know, we proved even in this open loop computation that you can do you know, things like needle driving. Um, but still, it's not, you know, it's not the ultimate. Um, so we said, well, what about closed loop commutation? And so um, this, this paper was also a finalist, I think. Um, but I don't think, I don't think this one uh, either. Um, anyway, you know, that's the, uh, that's the game. Um, but, but the idea here was, what this was challenging is now we needed to track the rotor position. And remember, the, well, there's a couple things. The, the, the ferrous material creates artifacts, but it only creates artifacts if you're inside a water-filled material that can be imaged in the first place, okay? So if you, have the, if you have the ferrous material out in air, you can't see it at all. Um, so, so here was the challenge. On the one hand, um, if we put a fiducial marker here at a random position that, uh, you know, an MRI uh, fiducial marker, a vitamin E capsule, you know, if we put it randomly over here, then it could be imaged except if it fell in the artifact of the ferrous material, okay? So then it would be invisible and we wouldn't see it, okay? Um, but on the other hand, we can't see the ferrous material at all. So, um, so Christos came up with this idea of modifying the RF frequency to create uh, an artifact region around the ferrous material and then to place the fiducial mar marker within that artifact region so that he could see it. Um, and it was a nice, nice clever idea, worked really well. And, and so this is the pulse sequence uh, that he came up with at the top. So what you can see is um, it takes 28 milliseconds to uh, detect the rotor in two dimensions, two seconds to do the image processing, um, and then however much time you want to actuate. So if, if you want your, just to, to interpret this bottom diagram for you, if you want your magnetic gradient applied orthogonal to the rotor to get maximum torque, you need psi equal to 90 degrees. So you'd like the angle to stay right here. And of course, if you, um, because this is the, you know, a, a very stupid, there's no estimator in here. So as, the, uh, as it applies the gradient, as the rotor rotates, the error increases. And so where, that's where you can see if you have a long actuation time, you get these this this big errors from 90, whereas if you have a shorter time, it's closer. And we simply need to go back and uh, you know, do a, for a few more experiments, put an estimator in there, 
um, in order to, uh, you know, to get better performance. But this was a case where they told us, uh, oh, the scanner is going down in one week, you know, so Chris has got as many experiments done as he could um, to get the paper together. And it's the only time I've ever gotten um, an ICRA paper a month before the deadline. I fell out of my chair when he handed me that. Um, so, so let's go back uh, to the scale issue. You know, I have to admit, um, I only worked on a needle driver because it was big, and it's usually easier to work on big things. I don't think it's going to be the life-saving app. Um, but, but it was just easier to do, and the technology applies at all length scales. But I really think the more interesting things um, are the smaller things. So this intermediate scale uh, idea of implants, and then the very smaller scale. So um, let's see. Am I really, uh, what time is it? I, I've got, so when I started at 3.30, okay, so I don't have till five, right? Okay, I thought I was either going really fast or really slow. Um, so I'll, let me just spend a few minutes talking about, you know, these two things, um, just to give you a flavor of them, but I don't have the time to get into the details. So, so this is, this example of implants, you know, is, is is a big deal at my hospital. And they, you know, they bring kids in from all over the world um, who are born without an esophagus. So their throat ends in a pouch, and their stomach has a little nub on top. And if these two ends are long enough, what they do is cut them both open, pull them, sew them together, and you're all set, okay? But if the gap is too large, you know, it's five centimeters or more, they just can't pull it enough. Um, and so um, what they do or what they've developed, uh, there's a, a Dr. John Foker who was up at Minnesota who came down and, and uh, you know, worked with our surgeons. He developed this, this approach to using tissue traction forces. So he'll sew suture loops onto each end, um, pull them down around a rib using it as a pulley, pull these out the back of the child, they put what looks like a big plastic button and they sew the suture loops off there. And every day they come back in and they take, uh, you know, it looks like wire insulation tubing, and they shove it under the knot to make it a little tighter. Shove it under the knot. And, you know, six weeks later, um, where they've been doing x-rays every other day, um, they see if the, t the ends have grown long enough that they can sew them together. And the, uh, I can't say the killer, but the critical thing here is these kids are sedated on a ventilator for this entire period. So you take a kid who's, you know, maybe three months old or whatever, um, you know, what is going on in their neurocognitive development if they're sedated for a month or two, getting all of these x-rays. You know, if you give an x-ray to an 80-year-old or 90-year-old, so what, you know? Um, <laughs> and, you know, because there's just, there's not gonna be a 20-year period for some cancer to develop. You got a three-month-old, my gosh, that's a whole lifetime where something could go awry. So, you know, real motivation to do this better. And, and so, the idea being, if we can create um, an implant that's free-floating in here, we're not, and that why do you sedate them? Well, you know, even if you're three months old, you're still moving your arms and legs. And when you move your arms and legs, your ribs shift, and they've pulled these things so tight that they're gonna pop all the sutures out. And they already have a problem of when the sutures pop out, they gotta go and reoperate and reattach sutures, okay? So if you can get a good way to attach the sutures, and you can have something that's basically free-floating inside, um, then you can hopefully avoid the sedation. If it has sensors in it, or, or you're using MRI to image displacement, you don't need to do all these x-rays. So that was, you know, the vision we had, um, and that's what we're working towards here. And, and you know, I, I happen to be giving this talk, you know, that, that Howie's at, uh, well, attending this conference in London, and I bumped into this guy who says, hey, you know, you're at Boston Children's Hospital, you guys are getting a pediatric MRI scanner, the first one in the world, stuck next to your ICU unit. It's like, really? <laughs> you know, I didn't even know that. I went back, they said, oh yeah, we're getting that. So, you know, we'll have one right there to, to play with this idea. But in the short term, you know, there's so many complexities in this. We've gone ahead and we've prototyped one that's powered by a DC motor. We just got that into ICRA. Um, and, you know, in the end, MRI is expensive. There are whole sorts of cost pressures right now. So whether an MRI-powered device will will make it remains to be seen. 
um, but it's a cool target to shoot for, and certainly a, a DC powered one will provide uh, you know a lot of the benefits that we that we want. So just popping over to a million micro robots, there are all sorts of crazy ideas where you can think about using these. Um, you know, and I, I talked to a whole bunch of. Uh, neurosurgeons about this and other clinicians, and they're like, oh, this is really cool. I have no idea how I can use this. Um, but we're pushing ahead, you know, the, the idea is that you could, you know, they, some people say, well, if you could put a network of pressure sensors in the ventricles, that would be, we could use that, okay? But how do you get it there? So we're working on this concept of, you know, injecting them in the lumbar region of the spine, having them swim up to position, using the MRI to control them. Um, the, uh, the two topics that we've been working on so far is one is motion planning, and so I don't know if this movie actually played or not. It's a little bit hard to see, but the idea is by using uh, uh, alternating pulses of pro appropriate relative size, we can get um, these millimeter scale robots to, you know, to swim at different rates to control their positions, a la Eric Diller. Not quite as sophisticated as his work, but you know, along the same lines. Um, and then secondly, we've also been looking at payload delivery. So could we swim these robots somewhere and then deliver a drug right in that uh, sort of spot? So those things are, are ongoing here. So let me just uh, wrap up at this point, you know, thank uh, my sponsors who I'm fortunate enough to have them, uh, you know, send some money my way and of course all the talented people who've been uh, helping me get this work done. So and thanks to you for, uh, for listening and staying through my talk. Yeah, I'm waiting for that famous grilling. You have mentioned about one probe for chewing the tissue, like while doing the surgery. What if it falls down while chewing? Is it difficult to regrab it? I, I didn't quite catch that. So you're talking about the tissue removal tool. Yeah. Is that the, right? The one which is used for chewing the tissue. Yeah. So what if it falls down into the heart? If the tool or the tissue? The tissue. Like is it oh. difficult to regrab it? Um, yeah, it would be, you know, the thing is it's morselizing the tissue. So the pieces are going to be so small, they would be hard to see. But what we do as a backup is they have these embolic filters. Um, and you put that downstream of where you're working to catch any debris that escapes from your chewing process. It's like a big fish net that goes across the vessel. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, about the same tool. So, what's the value uh, of this, this tool for uh, people against the uh, higher ablation catheter? Well, an so, so um, an ablation catheter is going to, you know, it's going to uh, kill the tissue, okay? But it's not necessarily going to remove the tissue volume, okay? If you kill it, scar tissue will form there. Now, so there, there are a lot of cases where you actually need to remove the tissue. It's, it's, uh, it's either blocking the flow or interfering with the surrounding function. And so you need to physically remove it. Um, so that's, I think, the, you know, the difference. It's a difference in, in what the problem is that you're treating. Yeah. So you mentioned about MRI that if there's a magnetic material, will distort the image. So in that sense, when you go into scale small devices that you showed at the end, and you start, you still try to use, I, I imagine, MRI imaging or that. So how could that happen if you want to observe the robot and the tissues with the MRI and try to control the magnetic you know, no, sphere? It's, it's, so how would that distortion problem? So it's it's a very it's a very good it's a very good question, very big challenge, um, and it's it's going to be it's actually sort of a common challenge. Um, in that, you know, that we have even with our continuum robots, in that, you know, you can see, well, it'll be easy to track the robot, okay, because we can use the artifacts it produces to track it or tweak those artifacts to provide accurate tracking. The question is, you know, imaging the tissue that's adjacent to it. And we even have that with the continuum <coughs> robots, that our imaging artifacts are right around the tip of the robot, and as we get close, we can't see the tissue anymore. So, you know, when you play games with, okay, where is my target? Um, and I know what the distance is. I move over, 
um, to get there. There may be some tricks where we can you know, move the artifact away so that we can image right at that point. But it's something we're going to have to tackle. Um, I don't think it's insurmountable. Um, you know, it depends on exactly what you're trying to do. If you're trying to hit an area and release a drug, you know, then you just start with an offset move all of it. Yeah. So, so for the steerable cannulas, uh, two questions. One is, what's the diameter, the outer diameter of the largest part of this cannula? Uh, it's, it's around four millimeters. And then I noticed in one of the figures, so one of the videos you had, the, the cannula was sort of like a gyration motion. In this, this kind of motion. It wasn't uh, back and forth or going along a line. I was just curious. Which video was that? The one from the first video. Uh, no, doing but doing a, what task? There were a few videos. I'm trying to figure out which one. It was, it was it was after you mentioned the PFOs. Uh, so I, I don't oh, was that the one where it was in the cut open heart? Yeah. I, oh yeah, yeah. So so the point was that had the cutting tool at the end, and the best pattern for removing tissue is to to yeah. sort of oscillate over. Yeah. yeah. So how did you achieve that motion? There, there was how, so, so I'm trying to understand, you know, what are the things that what motions are you coordinating to get this pyrowet motion? Are you pulling the thing in? You're twisting the, the, the tubes with respect to each other? So, so the way that experiment was done, we're using a phantom omni as a master. Uh -huh. And we have the, the orientation of the stylus um, tied to the orientation of the tip of the robot right. and the translation scaled in some appropriate way. So we're just moving the master like this. And the tubes are doing whatever they need to do through the kinematic model to follow that motion. So that's my question. So you have the kinematic model for the tubes to sort of uh, feed, unfeed, and rotate with respect to each other in order to get this kind of perfect Right, motion. right. Yeah. Yes? So you talked a good bit um, on your steerable cumulative here about the fact that this is a the design wants for every procedure kind of problem. Um, that you know, you're going to do a procedure um, closing this hole between the right or whatever, and then you design, look at the space you're operating in, design the right kind of tubes, put them together, and now you have to check for this procedure. Yeah. But you're working in a pediatric hospital where children are of all different ages and sizes. I mean, some of these obviously you're doing right after birth. But in the more general sense, do you see a way to making more generalized sets of these tools where you can say, oh, I need to do this procedure, let me pull out the chart, oh yes, I need, you know, Toolkit 7Z, which also gives yeah. you these other 107 different procedures. Yeah, I, I, I think that would definitely be the case, that there would be you know, a variety of sizes as well as you know, for a specific procedure. And that's the way it is now, of course. You know, if you, you've got a whole set of catheters and some have longer, tighter curves, some have less curve, different lengths. So it, it, uh, yeah, it would be that way. The other thing about a pediatric hospital is that everything is extremely low volume. So if I hope to commercialize this, I have to do it around an adult application. Uh, unfortunate reality, there's no money in pediatrics. It's a constant battle that we face. But for something like brain surgery in an adult, where again, there's so much variation there from one yeah. to the next, I was just curious how, how tightly you're having to optimize to a given problem space. Yeah, but with the brain surgery one, you, you know, you're exactly right that, the, that the, a tumor, for example, can pop up anywhere. And so there's, in some sense, there's a huge uh, variety. But if you were to break the, re the, the brain down into regions, that's the way we tackled that. We broke it into regions and said, OK, if you want to reach this region, then you want to navigate around the known eloquent portions to get there um, and then have such and such a workspace. Um, so it's, you know, it's that sort of approach. But you know, the, the, I think the wonderful thing about medicine is you can always speculate, but until you actually tackle a specific problem, you know, you don't know what it what it's going to take to solve it. George, uh, you're using the gradients in a way that they're not designed for. I mean, they usually go at 100 megahertz or 50 megahertz, and you're going at whatever 10 hertz or something. Um, and, and you said that that you, you have. To you said they you have larger amplitudes when you're actually driving the motor than when you're doing the imaging. They're not designed to do that. Do you have to alter them? Or? See, this is exactly the kind of thinking I'm talking about. <laughs> 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 
that it, um, you know we uh, we wish the the grain coils were producing a lot more than what they can, and we're bumping up against the limit. So the typically it's 40 millitesla per meter is the maximum gradient. There's a maximum uh, temporal slew rate based on. Uh, if you exceed that, the but patient that starts tingling. I don't care if I tingle. No uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so you know, that's why we, we use a, you know high transmission ratio here. There are scanners now. You know, the, there's a group in Boston that have like 200 millitesla per meter for for detailed brain imaging. Not clear at all if that will catch on. Um, but it's we're you know, we're right at the limits of what they're. Uh, are, there, are there any reasons that it can't go that slow? I mean, are they, are they not designed to run that? They are designed to run that slow. But you, the frequencies? Yeah. They, oh, you can go. You know, you can go down to zero frequencies. That's that's not uh, that's not bad. But we are at that maximum amplitude, and then getting that uh, to vary the way we'd like. I guess they do go slowly too. I think we have they do yeah. go slowly. Yeah, but now we're you know we're trying to do exactly what it's not for, you know. And, and the other thing is that you know that they, that you talk to the imaging people and they say, you know, no, the gradients can't do that. They can't apply forces, and you have to explain. Well, you know, you're thinking of the gra the imaging gradients, and and it's these these complementary gradients that are actually we're using. And oh yeah yeah yeah. So, actually, I was mixed up. I was thinking of the RX. So the gradients do go to the right frequency range. Yeah, the gradients are the right frequency range. RF really high, you're right. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yes? So you're talking a lot about working on a um, heart in motion. Are you using the ultrasound to actually track the position of the heart while you're doing these procedures to ensure that as it's beating, you're not moving your tool? Yeah, so it's live uh, 3D, real-time ultrasound. But are you, are you actually in, uh, in the control system, feeding that into what the, the actual uh, operator is doing, or do they actually have to track? No, we don't have. That's hand? well. That's an interesting. That's a. It's a very interesting and important issue. You know, we've been working to date in the atria. The pressures are lower. Um, we can, uh, you know, without being stupid about it, you know, we can press against the tissue and it's moving some, but it, it just it stretches like around us. And the robot is compliant too. You know, but one of the one of the beautiful things that we found about the robot is that it's it's rock solid. So because the imaging is so bad, you're constantly wondering, am I where I really think I am? And the beauty of the robot is you can get it somewhere, pause it, and then take literally 10 minutes, move the ultrasound, take a fluoro, okay, I really am where I think I am. Let's eject something out of there. So now when we go down to the ventricles, which is where we're going to go next and look at valve repair, um, then there's a, you know, a bit of a question. Um, what we've seen so far is uh, you can stick hand tools, you know, laparoscopic type tools in there. And as long as they're blunt enough, you can actually grab onto things without damaging it. But there's a, you know, there's a controversy in terms of, uh, gee, do I want to create a motion compensation catheter? And, and it's, I, I think the jury's out on balancing passive compliance uh, with active uh, compensation um, and what you really need to do the surgery. Um, we're going to have to try it and find out. This is the last question today. Okay. So, uh, and when I purchase image, there's a lot of advantages, but um, I'm curious when you start to use a push limit of MRI to go higher gradients and also. I've been operating with MRI for long duration while you do both imaging and act actuation. Uh, have you looked at the safety issues that, that could bring up in the sense of patients? Well, the, you know, the, uh, one of the things about writing one of these codes is you're already starting off with 20,000 lines devoted to safety. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, they're built in so that they're not going to, um, you know, exceed certain limits. But it's, it's, you know, one of the beautiful things about MRI, it's non-ionizing. So, you know, you are more likely to overheat the gradient coils and have a shutdown rather than the patient. Although, if you've got a really big patient, um, they could get warm over a long procedure. But it's, I, I don't think that's a real limitation at this point.
Okay, well, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you.